Hello and welcome to the Central Texas Mycological Society December meeting. Uh, we are joined here by Chris Garza, who is an ecologist extraordinaire, to give us a little uh, overview of ecology and my- mycology. So, Chris, if you will take it away. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm going to start just by giving you all some background on who I am. Um, my name is Chris Garza. I uh, My background is in biology. Um, I have a, a bachelor's in biology from St. Edwards University in Austin. Um, and then I have a master's in forestry from Texas A&M University. Um, and for my master's, I actually focused on forest entomology. So studying, I studied bark beetles in the Southwestern US. Um, and I can talk a little bit about um, fungi related to bark beetles maybe later in the presentation. Um, it's not a focus of this presentation, but um, I can talk about that to an extent. Um, really, my my education in school had very little to do with mycology. I took a forest pathology class, and that was probably the extent of my mycology training. And so forest pathology was not only the study of fungi that attack trees, but also insects, bacteria, viruses, even other plants, you know, plant parasites, um, plants parasitizing other plants. So um, that was basically, you know, what I learned in school about mycology. But after uh, finishing grad school, I worked at the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center for three and a half years. Um, and that's kind of where I fell in love with fungi. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center, it is, um, it's run more like a true nature center and less like a, what you'd expect from an arboretum. In other words, it's not trees from all over the world that are, you know, have little plaques explaining what those trees are. Instead, it's, it's trying to highlight, uh, Houston's ecosystems. And so we have, you know, at the Arboretum, there's prairie, there's savanna, there's uh, woodland, and there's some other, you know, ecosystems there as well. Um, but uh, the fungal diversity was just astoni- astonishing to me. And I, I think that's the reason I kind of gravitated towards liking plants and insects, um, just seeing diversity. And then I didn't realize fungal diversity until I I started working there, taking photographs of them, learning about them, and um, and just started to research what I was seeing, taking photographs of, and eventually realizing that there are all these really interesting relationships between some of those fungi and other things that I love, like plants and insects. So that's what this talk is going to, to focus on. Um, so mycology being the study of, of fungi, but ecology being the study of organisms and their relationships with other species, or it's the biotic and abiotic factors that influence them. So um, for this talk, though, I'm primarily focusing on biotic factors. And by that, I mean uh, living things that influence uh, fungi or that fungi have an influence on. Um, And I'll talk a little bit about abiotic factors and, in other words, how fungi work with... uh, the environment, um, but that's not necessarily the focus of this this talk. It's also not a general ecology talk, so I'm not going to talk about big picture ecology stuff. I'm kind of picking uh, some of my favorite examples of of some of these relationships that I've seen or learned about over time. Um, so on this first slide, I don't know if y'all can see my my cursor. I'm assuming you can. On the left um, is Amanita Jackson and I. Um, and that is that picture was taken at the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center. Um, on the right is another Amanita, and this one was taken in Minnesota. Um, but I really loved it has this maple leaf that landed on the cap, and um, those are finger galls. So those little galls on the leaf are, are those little structures on the leaf are where insects uh, have developed and emerged from. Um, they're probably little wasps or something, you know, flies or something else, but um, yeah. Okay, 
So I kind of like to start the talk with, um, let me see. There we go. With kind of how I fell in love with fungi. So I'm just going to start, you know, sharing pictures. Um, so I really fell in love with fungi because I thought they were pretty. Um, and so, you know, I started seeing different colored ones. This one's the flower pot parasol. Uh, you'll see it growing in mulch or you'll see it sometimes growing in flower pots, potentially even in your house. Um, and uh, it's saprobic, in other words, or, or as a saprophyte. Um, so it uh, basically is just a decomposer. So if you see it growing in your flower pots, um, it's not necessarily doing any harm to your plant. It's not a parasite. Um, it's basically probably decomposing your potting soil. Um, uh, so here's another interesting colored one. This one's kind of a pinkish color. This is the lilac oysterling. And I'm, you know, again, not a mushroom expert. So if somebody has corrections on my, my IDs, feel free to correct them. Um, here's a lactarius indigo. It's a blue, blue mushroom that we see in this area. Um, I'm not sure how common it is in central Texas, but uh, we see them quite a bit here in the Houston area. Um, here on the left is a panis species. Uh, it's a nice purple fuzzy mushroom. Um, I was going out day after day to photograph these because they were changing a bit each day. There's some little, uh, I think they're rove beetles that are hanging out in the gills there. So sometimes you see purple fuzzy mushrooms, sometimes you see kind of purple gelatinous looking uh, fungi, like this woodier fungus on the, on the right. Um, here's the snow fungus. Um, and I, we'll actually talk about that one a little later, one of the ecological uh, interactions that it has. Um, here's another kind of gelatinous fungus, uh, an amber jelly. Um, and then here's kind of a yellowish uh, or yellow jelly fungus. Uh, these here are pretty common, uh, especially at the Houston Arboretum on, on down pine logs, uh, which after the drought of 2011, you know, there's quite a few down pine logs throughout the Arboretum. Um, this one's called the train wrecker. And one of the reasons it has the name the train wrecker is because you'll see it growing on, on railroad ties. Um, so even those that have been, you know, treated with creosote or whatever they treat them with, uh, these fungi can still grow in those, those train ties. Um, and they can grow to be pretty massive. I mean, I've seen the caps to be, you know, the size of a dinner plate, basically. And then there's some really tiny fungi too. So these are some little pinwheel uh, fungi growing on a leaf. Um, those stalks are, you know, like as thin as hair. Let's see. Okay, here's, um, this is just showing that, you know, not all fungi have gills. Some have pores. Again, there's some little rove beetles hanging out in there. And then here's some fungi with teeth. Um, Spongipellus pachydon on the right. And this is the stilted puffball. And I found this growing in, in Big Bend. Um, so that's just to show that, you know, that you can even find fungi in the desert. Um, and I guess this one can uh, last a pretty long time. Uh, this one on the right, you know, they're the same species, but this one was way older. Um, and it probably, it looks like it still has spores that uh, hang on even after who knows how long it was alive, but. So you have those, and then you have some that, that seem to grow up overnight, and then they, uh, by mid-morning, they're already, you know, uh, falling apart and decaying. So those are some, some ink caps there. Um, then you have some that can grow for years. Um, this is Fomus uh, fomentarius or, or fasciatus, one of the two, I can't remember, but the hoof fungus is a common name for it. 
here's a Lactarius. So if you damage the underside or I'm not sure if the stipe, which is the stalk of the fungus, too, would do the same thing, but it will release kind of a milky uh, substance if you damage it. And then some just exude uh, liquids like this blushing rosette. Um, there's also a fungus called a bleeding tooth fungus that does a similar uh, thing. This is called gutation. And my understanding is that when it's just rapidly growing and um, and the conditions are right, so it, potentially when it's really humid, um, they start releasing these droplets. Um, and it's mostly water, but there's some other um, chemicals in there that can make them other colors. So in this case, it kind of came out as like amber and, and kind of reddish colors. And you'll see that on plants too. Um, so maybe you've, you've walked out one really humid morning and on the edges of leaves, you'll see all these droplets like perfectly lined up on the tips of the leaf. And that's gutation uh, occurring on plants as well. Sometimes you'll see them in huge numbers. Uh, this is trooping crumble, trooping crumble cap on the left. Um, and uh, I forget the common name of this one. Uh, I, I mean, I forget the scientific name too, but it's uh, something like the pine sap ginger tail or pine, pine wood ginger tail. And the scientific name is like zero. It's with an X, Campanella, something like that. Um, some of them resemble uh, bird's nests. These are called bird's nest fungi as a common name. Um, and I'm seeing the chats, but I'm probably gonna wait till the end to address those if that's all right with y'all. Um, so yeah, this um, you know resembles bird's nests. These are, uh, they're not actually the spores, but they're spore containing structures. Um, and during rain events, they'll splash out of the the little cups and then get spread that way. And you'll see them growing in mulch pretty often. Um, and then here's a kind of a coral-like fungus. It's actually a false, false coral. Um, it's more closely related to the jelly fungi than it is the uh, coral fungi. Um, here is a uh, Xylaria hypoxylon. It's got a bunch of common names. Um, but they just bear their spores right on the outside of, of them. So conditions were just right one morning to kind of frame it with the light. And you can see the spores just flying off. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, we could just sit here probably mesmerized by that for a while. Um, yeah, some of the common names for it are um, like candle snuff fungus, uh, I don't know, like stag antlers. I don't know what all the names are. Um, it's closely related to the dead man's fingers. I think, you know, I've even called them dead man's fingers too, but they're like a miniature version basically. Um, different species though. Uh, some have their spores on the inside. So here's a puffball. Probably everyone's pretty familiar with puffballs. Um, but probably the natural way that the spores are spread for that is as rain as well. So when the rain hits them, um, you know, the pressure from the rain pushes out the spores. Okay, so um, basically all that was to say, I love seeing the diversity and that's kind of how I fell in love with uh, fungi. And um, this one is just to show, this is the split gill mushroom and this one is just to talk about uh, even within one species that there can be diversity. So um, there's over 200,000 sexes, I believe, of the split gill mushroom. Actually, the Central Texas Mycological Society just had a post on Instagram about it um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago or so. Um, it's a really interesting fungus. Um, but yeah, it's got just this huge diversity of sexes within one species. And um, another interesting fact about it is that it can actually grow uh, in humans. So um, 
most likely it would grow in humans with, you know, uh, immune deficiencies. So it's not common by any means, but it is possible. Um, but uh, for the most part for this talk, I'm gonna be talking about interactions between um, fungi and other organisms. Um, and so that's kind of where the ecology comes in. And again, it's gonna focus on biotic relationships. So, um, you know, uh, less so their interactions with the environment. Um, so, uh, but speaking of that, the most common uh, role that fungi seem to play in our environment or that we think of them as playing is the role of the decomposer. And so that is kind of their uh, big abiotic role. And it's kind of indirectly um, a biotic relationship that it has with um, almost you know all plants because they're basically living in soil or living in logs and decomposing them. So here you see a bunch of puffballs on a log and inside that log are just a huge number of mycelia, these root-like structures. And um, they're taking really hard to decompose uh, uh, compounds and cell walls of plants and they're breaking them down and allowing them to go back into the soil and be used by, uh, you know, other plants and other organisms that can also break them down further. Um, but things like lignin and cellulose and the cell walls of, of plants, they can kind of break that stuff down and make it available, get all the other minerals and nutrients that are inside those cells available as well. Um, so, um, and that's a kind of an oversimplification of it, but, um, yeah, that's not really the focus of this uh, presentation. Uh, so here's another uh, mushroom that plays a different role. This is a, an amanita, and the amanitas are known to be mycorrhizal, largely mycorrhizal. So what that means is that they are working together with plants, um, and they have this mutualistic relationship with plants. So the plants provide some sugars and nutrients to the fungi. The fungi also have this high, highly, you know, they have a very uh, high surface area with their mycelia and um, they can absorb water and nutrients uh, better than tree roots can. And so they can provide some of these, these to the tree and then the tree provides them with um, some sugars and perhaps other things as well. Um, what was more recently discovered was the, um, interactions between, uh, trees using a fungal network. So in other words, these fungi could potentially be, um, connected to so many different trees, even trees with that are not the same species. And when a tree, uh, of one or just any tree that has this myco mycorrhizal relationship is being attacked, say, by a beetle. Um, it can basically uh, communicate through those mycorrhizal interactions that um, it's being attacked and, um, and the other trees that are also attached to that mycorrhizal network can start producing compounds to try to, you know, prevent um, the same kind of beetle attack. So um, that's something that's still, you know, largely misunderstood or, you know, that we're still figuring out, you know, exactly how this works and everything. But, um, and again, probably an oversimplification of it. Um, but again, it's not, it's not really the focus of this stuff. Um, here's another role that they play. Um, actually on the left, you're actually saying it's armillaria, but it's playing the role of a uh, saprophyte there. Um, but this is to show some parasitic uh, fungi. So armillaria can be parasitic. Um, and then on the right is Kretschmaria dusta. And it's, it's actually not what it looks like for most of the year. That's really in the spring when it's growing rapidly. Again, you can see the guttation um, 
that oozing liquid. Um, but most of the year, it looks like a black crust. And you'll see it at the base of hackberries or sugarberries. And it's, it's a really bad one. Um, so if you have a hackberry or, or sugarberry in your yard, check the base of your tree and make sure it doesn't have the black crust on it because um, I see a lot of trees fail. Basically, this fungus is just eating away at the buttress of the tree. Um, and it, you know, softens the wood. And during a big rainstorm or, you know, heavy wind, uh, I'll see a lot of trees that fail because that fungus was at the base of them. So, um, yeah, if you uh, want to send send me a picture somehow, we can get in touch. And if you think you might have Crutchmaria dusta, you should definitely do something about it. Um, but yeah, both of these are are parasitic, but this one can sometimes be a saprophyte. So, and and this one probably can be a saprophyte as well. Once the tree is dead, it probably still does some work to to decompose it. Okay, so here's a really interesting parasite. So now we're kind of getting more into you know what I wanted to talk about, which is sp some specific examples that I find really interesting. Um, this one is cedar hawthorn rust or cedar apple rust or juniper hawthorn rust. Uh, there's a bunch of different species, um, but basically they uh, this fungus requires two different hosts to complete its life cycle. Um, and so one of, and they're two totally different plants, uh, which is just really fascinating to me that this, you know, fungus was able to specialize and and pick these two totally different plants to cr cr go through its entire life cycle. Um, but um, so this is it on the juniper uh, phase, and this you'll see this in the spring. So in the um, spring when it starts to get wet. If you look at juniper trees, sometimes you'll see these little structures. And this is over three days in a row. Um, again, I was working at the Arboretum. I kind of was expecting this to happen. And so I was checking those trees every day and like seeing how it progressed. And it's the exact same, same one every day. Um, but yeah, basically, you know, day three, it's got these kind of orange uh, tentacle looking things. And um, the, when the water splashes off of it, um, it can send spores splashing onto the leaves of nearby um, hawthorns or members of uh, the, that family, the rose family. Um, and it's usually pretty specific to, uh, say, hawthorns or apples or whatever. Um, but there's different species, Gymnosporangium, I think, is the, is the genus. Um, and um, yeah, I, the, what it looks like on the hawthorn, by the way, is just splotches on the leaves. It's far, far less exciting. Um, you'll see like orange or yellow splotches on the leaves. Um, and that's, that's its life cycle on the hawthorn. Um, so another example of parasitism. Um, so here's a, here's a parasite, but this is actually a plant that parasitizes fungi. So um, this is uh, Indian pipe or ghost pipe are some common names for this. And we do have this in um, East Texas. Uh, I'm not sure that it would really grow in Central Texas, but um, yeah, it's a plant. Um, and you'll notice that it doesn't really have uh, any chlorophyll. It's not green at all. And that's because uh, it gets all of its nutrients by taking them from a fungus. And it specializes on the rusulas. So um, yeah, basically, you know, it's it's stealing nutrients from, from fungi below ground, and, and that's where it gets all of its nutrients to, to grow up and flower. Um, OK, so here's this image of that snow fungus I showed earlier. Um, and it's also a parasite, but it's a parasite of another fungus. Um, so these are the hypoxylons and annula hypoxylons on the right. Um, not super thrilling to, to look at, you know, kind of these black crusty fungi, but uh, these are required 
um, inside the wood, not necessarily the fruiting bodies, but inside the wood, there would be, you know, this mycelial network um, of this fungus. And then you have the snow fungus that um, it needs that fungus in there to, to grow. Um, and the snow fungus is an edible, um, it was talked about in a previous presentation. And um, I don't know personally how to cook with it and I've never done it. Um, but uh, some people spoke to some desserts, I think even that you could do with it. Okay, another parasite it, are the cordyceps fungi. And um, this is one that Jeremy, if y'all know Jeremy, he spotted this one during a foray in the big thicket um, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, there's multiple cordyceps fungi. Um, and so I don't know exactly which one this is, but it's on a paper wasp, um, some kind of polistes, I think. And um, yeah, and there's no obvious fruiting body coming off of this yet. It kind of looks like almost just mycelia sp spilling out from all the segments in between the the body of the wasp. Um, but um, super interesting. Uh, and it's the only instance I've ever come across of seeing, seeing cordyceps. So um, thank Jeremy for, for pointing that out. OK, so here's the stink horns. Probably many of y'all are, are familiar with stink horns. Um, maybe you've seen them. Maybe you've smelled them. Um, they are just really bizarre looking and uh, they make uh, some really fun, nasty smelling stuff that attracts flies and beetles. And, um, and that's where their spores are. So kind of this black goopy stuff on the left and the stuff on the tip of this one here. Um, you'll see some flies here. There's not even that much left. I think it's called gleba. It's the combination of spores and, and the liquid. Um, and so these flies and beetles land on it, and then they go travel elsewhere and deposit you know, those spores, and those spores can develop. That's basically how you know it's able to spread um, and get from place to place. Uh, this is the ash boli. And this is one of my favorites because it combines insects, plants, and fungi. Um, so, uh, this you'll see growing under ash trees. So you might think, oh, mycorrhizal, but no, it's not actually helping the ash tree. It's helping some insects that are feeding on the ash tree. Um, so there's root feeding aphids on the roots of an ash tree. And these fungi, uh, form these kind of protective structures with their mycelia over the aphids that are feeding. And then they get the honeydew from the aphids, um, which is, you know, uh, able to give them some sugars and nutrients that they need. And then they provide these like kind of coverings and protective structures for the aphids um, to continue feeding on the roots of those ash trees. So just a, a nice, fun uh, ecological interaction, especially because it combines three of the things I love. Okay, those of y'all in, in Austin are probably familiar with these leaf cutter ants, uh, Adotexana. Um, pretty common in the big thicket too. Um, less common in, in Houston. Um, we have, I want to say it's probably the soils. You know, the soils aren't very sandy. We do have Trachymermex, uh, which is another genus of ants that are also leaf cutters and um, and what they're doing is not actually cutting leaves so that they can eat the bits of leaves. They're cutting leaves because they're feeding a fungus that's in their nest. Um, so basically, they have this fungal garden that they have to keep alive. And so, you know, they, they go out and they collect little bits of leaves and things that will keep the fungus happy. And then they can eat the, the fungus. Um, so they're basically little farmers. Um, and so all of these workers are female, um, and uh, basically, you know, in the spring, or I don't know, I don't know exactly when their flight is, but 
they're going to time their flights together. So different colonies will all fly at the same time within that species um, and, and kind of a localized area. So like, you know, throughout Austin, you'll probably have all, all these colonies kind of time their flights at the same time. The females uh, or the future queens are born with wings. Um, and so they'll fly out. And then the drones, which are the males, are also born with wings and they'll fly out and uh, hopefully mix with, you know, queens and drones from different colonies. They'll mate in the air. It's called their nuptial flight. Um, and then a female will probably mate multiply with multiple males during her flight. She'll land somewhere, she'll roll her wings off, and then she'll start, you know, finding that place for her colony. So she'll start trying to find some soil that's that's right. Um, and that tends to be the case for, for how all ants, you know, uh, reproduce. The thing about uh, leafcutter ants is that leafcutter ants have to um, take a little bit of their fungal garden with them. So when those queens are leaving their nest, they have to take a little bit of that, that fungal material with them, carry it with their flight through their multiple mates, everything, you know, rolling off their wings and then digging up, digging a, a little chamber. They have to have that, that fungal piece with them so that they can start that garden over, um, you know, a little cloned garden from, from the uh, colony that they came from. So this is, uh, I've got several videos of this. This is a wasp called a stump stabber. And I just think they're gorgeous and, and really interesting. Um, what she's doing right here is laying her eggs into a, a, a log. And her ovipositor is really long. Um, I've got several videos here. Here she is removing her, her ovipositor. Um, and so you might be wondering, OK, what is this? What does this have to do with fungus? Well, she's laying her eggs in the log to parasitize another wasp. So there's another wasp whose larvae are inside of that log. And um, her young are going to eat the young of that other wasp. Um, let's give them names. So this one's the stump stabber. The other wasp is called a horntail wasp. Um, and um, so uh, you're like, OK, well, you still haven't mentioned fungi. What does that have to do with fungi? So the horntail wasp uh, requires not only the consumption of the wood that's in that log, but they need the, the log to be inoculated with um, a fungus. So they need to eat wood that's been, um, that has fungus in combination with the wood. So. Basically, when the mother horntail lays her eggs in the wood, she deposits not only her eggs, but she also deposits fungi into that log. Um, she has a structure on her ovipositor, which is her egg-laying structure called a mycangium, and that houses a little bit of fungi in it. And so when she's laying her eggs, she expels a little bit of the, the fungal, uh, whatever it is. I don't know exact, exactly if it's like in spore form or mycelia or what, but she deposits it, some of it. And so that starts eating through the wood and then her young are eating that combination of wood and fungus. Um, well, uh, so this wasp has to try to find the horntail wasp. And in order to do that, it's basically using its olfactory senses on its antenna and trying to pick up cues in the air um, and it's searching out for that fungus because that fungus is a telltale sign that there's a uh, larva that her young can eat. So um, that's how it all ties back together to fungi. So it's a, a wasp that's using fungi to locate its host. Um, and then she'll lay her eggs in that log so that her young can eat the young of the other wasp. Just another video. Told you I like to get videos of these. Um, yeah, and that's her ovipositor. So that's her egg laying structure. And then you can see it's, it's longer than she is, um, like the main part of her body. Um, 
and it's got three filaments. So one one is the actual ovipositor, and then two are just kind of like a sheath-like structure that can um, come together over her ovipositor. And she basically has to kind of drill it into the wood. Okay, so these are forked fungus beetles, um, and um, I just think they're really interesting looking. Uh, so these are males that have the horns, uh, like those on the right. Um, those are horns on their pronotum, but they also have horns on their head, which is down here. And their courtship involves standing on females. So uh, when they like a female, they'll just, you know, just stand on her back. And um, they'll stand there for, you know, 10 minutes or maybe more before the female gives a signal that she she wants to mate with a male. Um, other males who might be interested in that same female might try to use their horns to kind of pry pry off that male. So uh, they'll walk up to the male on, on top and they just start to try to knock him off. Um, and then they'll try to stand on her. Um, and, you know, sometimes they'll be standing backwards on them, sometimes forwards. You'll, you'll see them kind of in some interesting, uh, I've never seen three tall, but I'd, I'd love to see that. It'd be pretty exciting, I think. Um, these are the only images in my presentation that aren't my own. Um, so I just thought they were really fun. Somebody is doing a lot of research on these, on these forked fungus beetles, and I don't know how they're getting funding to do it. But I'm kind of I'm kind of grateful because they've led to some really fun uh, images. So here on the left, you can see an image of what it looks like when a male is trying to pry off another male. Uh, you can see this one was standing on the female backwards. Um, and then another thing that they tested was their grip strength. So in the case of you know maybe a male has smaller horns, he's not necessarily great at prying off other males, but if he's got really strong grip there's no way the other male's gonna be able to pry him off. So, so, you know, tie a little piece of string to him and test out their grip strength. Um, I just think that's some really great research. Um, okay, so coming back to this uh, fungus, and these, are, these might be two different species, Fomus fasciatus and Fomus fomentarius, but um, basically what I wanted to get into was, you know, these, these fungi actually have a long history with uh, humans as well. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Utsi. I think I'm saying the name right. It was this man who was discovered buried in the snow um, in the Alps. And because he was buried in the snow, he was preserved really well. And all of his belongings were preserved really well. Um, and so he had you know, clothes on him and things like that, tools. And he also had um, these fungi, uh, or he had one of them, one of the fungus species. Um, and uh, this was around 5,000 years ago. Uh, that's when they think you know he was alive. So um, he he not only had this one, but he had a, a birch polypore on him as well. And so you know they've like theorized why did he why did he carry these two fungi in particular? Um, and the birch polypore is known to be, um, have some medicinal properties. Um, and so that's why they think he carried that one. And then they think he carried this one because it's a, it's a good, uh, fire starter basically. Um, and, um, maybe y'all are familiar with Paul Stamets. Maybe some of y'all aren't, but he's kind of like become the modern face of fungi. Um, and he wears a hat made of amadou, which um, is a uh, almost like a felt or something that comes from that same uh, fomus species. So you know we're still using it today for things. Uh, if you're if you ever meet Paul Stamets, you probably don't want to sit around a campfire with him though. Not if he's wearing that hat because uh, it's still really flammable, just like the fire starter uh, in the fungus itself. So. Make sure he's not wearing that hat around the campfire. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's an example of, of fungi we know being used 5,000 years ago. 
But beyond that, we know that uh, fungi have been must have been being used medicinally and you know for eating for longer than that. So uh, on the right, we have well, on the, I'll start with the left. We have a Ganoderma. Uh, I think it's Curtisi. Maybe someone can correct me, but I think that's what it is. And then um, on the right, we have an oyster mushroom. And in me kind of researching and preparing for this presentation, I, I was trying to find the oldest, you know, documentation of the potential for humans using fungi. Um, and uh, basically there's, there's these scientists who have been looking at dental plaques and they're able to kind of look at these dental plaques from, from you know, early humans and uh, determine what kind of things were in their plaque. And uh, from that, they can, they can assess what they were eating. And so the oldest uh, fungi that they found in dental plaques that I could find anyway was 19,000 years old. So um, yeah, pretty incredible that, you know, we were experimenting with trying these, these fungi uh, 19,000 years ago. And then of course, you know, some of the most important uh, fungi, uh, yeast, uh, at least for human, you know, uh, interactions and human consumption. Um, of course, with with quarantine and and everything with COVID, uh, I I jumped on the the sourdough bandwagon, and uh, I actually just made some pizza with my sourdough starter today. Um, and on the right is some fermentation that I've got going. Actually, that's I've I've bottled that and drank most of it by now, but uh, it's a Brettanomyces uh, strain on the right. Um, so usually we, we think of Saccharomyces uh, when we're thinking of yeast, um, but there's Brettanomyces as well, and Brettanomyces forms some really cool looking biofilms. We call them pellicles uh, in the beer world. Um, but, you know, we've been doing this, and it's, I don't know why estimates range for so long, but 5,000 to 9,000 years we've been, you know, brewing and, and making bread with yeast. Um, uh, even before we knew what, what yeast was, you know, it was just basically this, this magical uh, thing that came out of the air and, and inoculated our food and made it better, our food and our drink. So um, super grateful for yeast. Um, and that's kind of the end of my, my presentation. Um, everyone should, especially if y'all are interested in fungi, please join the Central Texas Mycological Society. Um, you can follow them on Instagram at Central Texas Mycology. And if you want to follow me, see me where my images, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Swamp and Wolf. Uh, feel free to message me and, and ask me whatever. I'm not necessarily a, an expert, but um, the great thing about joining the Central Texas Mycological Society is like, everyone's kind of got different specialties. And, and so some people know about, you know, cultivating fungi, which I know very little about. Um, and other people know, you know, other little things, you know, <laughs> I, I tend to uh, be interested in the ecological things. Um, so yeah, by all means, please uh, join the two, you know, join, follow me and, and follow Central Texas Mycology and, um, ask us anything. I think we're all excited to talk about fungi. Um, and now I probably have a big, I have 33 questions probably to go through. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. So, um, do you know if the train wrecker fungi is used in mycoremediation projects? Um, I am not sure if it is. Um, in fact, I just I don't really have a, a whole lot of knowledge and background on on mycoremediation projects in general. I feel like it's something I should learn more about, but um, I don't know. I'm kind of one of those people who. I'm like, if I could do research, I probably would like 
pick the forked fungus beetle and just be like, yeah, let's learn more about this this beetle, even though it you know <laughs> probably doesn't contribute much to uh, society in general. My interests just lie with like, how can I how can I study you know how fungi are interacting with insects or trees or plants or whatever, um, and less so how they can save the world, which is probably what I should be more interested in. <laughs> um, let's see, Lorena. It has almond baru, fungal degradation, and but oh, you were answering. Oh, thank you, Lorena. That's great. Um. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, lots of people thanking Lorena. Thank you, Lorena, as well. Um. Oh, did we lose volume for a while? No, I don't know. Some people maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, here's another person who found some more information about that. Great. Thank you. I'm assuming the trad talk different from a Ted talk. Um, no, I've heard trad get, talk about bio, uh, bio or micro remediation, uh, other times at like other festivals that he's been at, like the Telluride mushroom festival or, uh, the, uh, mycosybiotics mushroom festival up in pennsylvania that okay. william does but uh yeah he, he's done a, he's he's done a lot of that a lot of that uh, micro remediation remediation research and that is one that he focuses on and that's kind of what led him to think that you know oh this would be a good one to use so if anybody who had that thought like yeah this would be a great mushroom to use for the for my uh, micro remediation you're you're on the right track so keep thinking like that. Yeah, that was m my ignorance too. I thought Trad Talk was like a TED Talk. Oh something. no, Trad Cotter. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, Carter asked, uh, what should you do if you see that fungus on your tree? I would think a fungicide wouldn't be great for the rest of the environment. Yeah, I would worry that um, it's already uh, done a lot of rotting. If you're seeing the fruiting body, you know, this crust at the base of the hackberry, um, I would assume that it's already kind of a, a hazard and I would, if the tree is in a place where it's going to, um, you know, like I see it all the time in the forest and if it's not somewhere where people commonly walk or things like that, you know, if it's off trail or whatever, you don't need to worry about it. But if it's next to your driveway, next to your house, next to the sidewalk, somewhere where people are frequently or valuable things are frequently, I would probably get it removed. Uh, one thing that I recommend is um, potentially getting a statue. That's what I call them, but basically getting the tree to a level where it's no longer dangerous. In other words, you know, maybe as tall as you. Um, and that way other things can utilize that log and as it's standing. So um, I guess in that case, you're still, it's hard because you're providing, uh, for the fungus that, uh, was the parasite. So potentially you're helping <laughs> that spread to other hackberries and sugar berries, but at the same time, it, you're allowing it to be a, um, host for other fungi and insects and all these other things that can utilize it. Um, yes, the snow fungus is edible and Somebody answered that, and uh, yeah, there were some really cool uh, recipes that if somebody would want to share those again, that'd be great. I'm not sure if the same people were here that were at the last hangout. Um, let's see. Is this referring to the cordyceps? Why see? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we do have, I think we do have native cordyceps. I'm not 100% on that, but I, I'm pretty sure, you know, they've just specialized on different uh, insects. So um, I'm sure we have, you know, multiple species of, of cordyceps um, that are native. What kinds of fungus do leafcutter ants cultivate? You know, I don't actually know, but it's only, I believe, one species 
So they're not cultivating necessarily. Um, and, and I think Phil, you actually talked to this a bit last time, but like, this isn't a fungus that they're cultivating to uh, like fruiting bodies. It's almost like a fungal mat um, that they're just feeding and it continues to, to form a mat and they're just eating off of the mat. So um, I want to say that, you know, because of the history with these ants through evolution, the fungus probably at one point may have had fruiting bodies, but no longer needs it because these ants are form such a strong relationship that they're just, you know, the, the fungus has no need to make a fruiting body anymore. It, it just gets spread around by these ants. Um, and it, I'm kind of speaking a little bit, you know, to, I haven't done all that research, but I'm, I'm I feel relatively confident saying that. Yeah. From yeah. what I remember, um, when I learned about that stuff, the, the termite cultivating, uh, the mushroom, the termites that cultivate fungi, those will form uh, mushrooms and people actually like eat those. But from what, from what I remember learning, like, yeah, they don't, they don't uh, form fruiting bodies and the, the fungus itself is completely um, just carried around by those ants. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I'm pretty sure all, that all these photos came from Texas. That's not, um, completely true let's see almost everything so the the i know the indian pipe that one's from uh minnesota but we do have them in texas um and then that first pick with the amanita that one is from minnesota as well but yeah, I think pretty much everything else is from Texas, yes. Um, all right. A nuptial flight picked up on the weather radar in Austin this past spring. That's incredible. I love that. Um, David Attenborough has something similar where he shows uh, moths, moth flights at night, I think, picked up by like, you know, Doppler radar kind of thing. Um, let's see. Oh, Joe Rogan with Paul Stamets. Yeah, Iceman had two mushrooms on him. Yep. Uh, wow. Yeah, you could have given that part of the presentation. Um, is that a scoby? No, I do have a scoby too. I love, I love my kombucha. Um, okay, talking about the festival here. Thanks for answering all that stuff. Um, and. Okay, here's a question asking about pictures and videos. What would I recommend to a beginner and aspiring photographer? You'll be probably shocked to learn that I took all of these with my phone. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, I have a, a Google Pixel 2 um, and it's got a fantastic camera on it. I don't, Oh, my phone was <laughs> responding to me. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, uh, that was distracting. Let's see. So I don't even really use any kind of macro uh, lens or anything for it, which they make those. And I actually did buy some, uh, but I have yet to use them. I just bought them like a, a couple weeks ago. So I'm looking forward to using those on my phone and seeing what kind of, you know, close-ups I can get of stuff. Um, yes, Jeremy, he found those cordyceps in the big thicket. You'd think it was, was a species of Bavaria. So is that not, that's a different genus then, huh? Or I don't know. It was, I don't know. Garrett, thank you for showing up. That's awesome. Uh, do people manage properties specifically for maximizing fungal populations? What would that look like? Todd, I love that question. That's that's yeah, where too. like my that's what I want to see. <laughs> um, I am less so interested in like cultivating one or two species. I want to see maximum fungal diversity. Um, I'm all about uh, 
I'm all about fungal diversity. I'm all about diversity in general, whether we're talking about, you know, just diversity in the workplace or diversity in nature. Like I, I love it all. Um, and uh, that's why I got interested in plants. And then I found out about insects and how diverse they are, were. And I honestly think fungi are probably more diverse than insects. We just don't know, uh, you know, all the numbers are, are showing that, you know, insects are the most diverse organisms on the planet, but I think that we just studied them more um, because they're uh, more macro level than, even though they're, they're small, um, I think that there's all these microscopic uh, fungi that are in the soil that are completely overlooked. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's what I want to see. And I want to build, I kind of, you know, was looking at the Central Texas Mycology uh, YouTube channel about like building beds. Uh, Phil gave the talk about like building beds for, for certain fungi. And I was like, man, I want to build a bed for like maximum diversity of fungi. Like, I just want to see, I just want to see as much stuff in like a square foot pop up as I, as I can, you know, I think that would be incredible. So, um, I like where your mind is at. I, I think, you know, um, the Houston Arboretum for anyone who's in Houston, we're talking about starting up a mycology volunteer group and, um, that'd be a fun project, you know, especially if we, um, if we go out and we, we pick to ID at the end of the, at the end of the foray, um, if we can pick a spot where we want to try to like put those caps so that they can, you know, put spores into the, into the mulch or the soil or the bed or whatever we decide, if we keep putting them there and then we, like, that could be like our little spot where we can just go back and be like, what's popping up is some of that stuff that we threw in that mulch popping up yet. You know, I think that'd be really fun. Um, and so Todd, I'll let you know in the future, maybe what that looks like. If we can, if we can pull it off. Um, any other questions? I can go back and forth too, if y'all want me to, go back to a certain slide and y'all can, I don't know, Phil, what do you think? Are we at the point where, you know, people can mic in if they want? Yeah, people can mic in if they want. Um, I like having the the mushroom photos on the screen though. That looks really nice for the, sure. for the broadcast that we just kind of pop in and out of the corner as we speak. Um, uh, and I also to kind of get to Todd's question, because that's something also I'm really passionate about uh, is like, you know, cultivating fungi, at, at, you know, managing the forest and stuff to, to uh, maximize fungal populations. And a lot of that is like, uh, just not having the forest bulldozed and, and like turned over into neighborhoods and things like that. So things we can do, you know, socially to minimize our footprint into new territory and even, you know, return some of that land to, uh, you know, a more fr fungal friendly state. Uh, that would be kind of what I would like to see in the future. Um, but yeah, so, you know, pr protecting the the diversity of those like forest stands, like Chris was talking about, you know, um, and kind of making sure you have a good diversity of your tree species uh, will kind of help, you know, maximize that kind of uh, stuff. As far as like getting more mushrooms to grow in a place, like you just kind of got to go find them on the right day. Because out out uh, in that area, in the big thicket area and that stuff, uh, not too long ago, like the a uh, couple years ago, I guess at this point, um, but out on one of our friends' land, you know, the the whole forest floor was covered in chanterelles. Like you didn't have to do anything except have the forest there. So like that, and and fungi, I think, are one of the best examples of like if we protect our our uh, ecological diversity and help that just function like we can live in abundance so 
Yeah. I kind of talk about that in my my other the talk that's on the YouTube mycology in the garden where I talk a lot about soil and land use and stuff like that too. So check that out. Yeah, great. Thanks, Phil. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Sammy, I saw your question and I'm glad that got answered. We there is a that YouTube channel, and Phil, this will be on there, right? Yeah, this is streaming on there now, and it'll be there for posterity. Great. And Annika shared the uh, Arboretum uh, information. If you want to get on the Arboretum uh, email list. Let's see, Carter. Talk about permaculture. Yeah, for sure. Permaculture. Restore the land. Hell yeah. Carter's oh. got a oh, or, oh Perry. Okay. Perry's got a, a forum that everybody can check out about uh, permaculture, um, getting agriculture that designs for biodiversity, which is awesome. Um, I'm all about that biodiversity. Anything else? Yeah, any more questions? This was super fun. Yeah. Uh, those wasp videos were blowing my mind. Just like, <laughs> it's so surreal. I was just thinking like, people are always worried about like cordyceps fungi infecting people or whatever. And I was like, no, that's the kind of stuff. What? <laughs> a, a wasp, a giant wasp that like comes in yeah. and lays its well, eggs inside of you. That's terrifying. That's what yeah. happens to insects all the time. <laughs> so those are... Uh, they're non-stinging, you know, so most of the parasit parasitic wasps don't actually sting. Um, and, um, but yeah, it looks like it would have a wicked sting, you know, just by the length of its ovipositor, but it's, it's just an egg-laying structure. Uh, yeah. Not a murder hornet. <laughs> no. Um, Any recommendations for folks who are new to mushroom hunting and exploring the wild? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, I would start just looking for places to hike and um, start noticing where you're seeing fungi. So, um, you know, I was talking about the Arboretum and hiking around there and um, and there are certain trails and things like that where I was like, this just seems to have more fungal diversity um, than other spots. And, and so you start to kind of like pick certain trails. If you're looking for mushrooms in particular, it's like, um, I'm walking the inner loop, I'm walking the ravine. Like those are, those are my hotspots for fungi there. Um, and you'll kind of just pick that up once you start um, walking around and and noticing where you're seeing them. Uh, if you're in central Texas, um, you know, you're going to want to probably like go to the, the green belt and you're going to want to find like some of these spots with like down logs and relatively close to, um, you know, the, the streams and stuff like that because you know, there's just the issue with central Texas is moisture and there's some, there's several species that, you know, you'll see further from that. But in general, if you're looking to see different stuff, I would recommend, you know, trying to find some of these spots and you'll just pick up on it after time and be like, that's the spot I'm going. Cause I've seen a lot of cool stuff there. Um, and, um, just return regularly because, you know, a lot of this stuff is seasonal. You'll only see it, you know, for a few weeks and then you go a couple weeks later and, and it's totally different, you know, what kind of stuff is popping up. So, um, yeah, that's what I recommend. Um, does anyone here study or pu publish about parasitism? I'm looking to write a paper on it and would love to pick your brain or in a collaborative, collaborative relationship, not one that kills the host. Nice. Um, so, um, what kind of papers are you talking about, Sammy? Are you talking about uh, scientific papers 
like journal yeah i'm 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 talking about like writing my thesis on like um focusing on the collaboration that species and interspecies do rather than competition so sort of like not denouncing darwin but saying you know it, it's not all about competition and maybe it's not about competition at all it's more about collaboration and cooperation between species and within the species yeah. and the genes um and so i've just been putting together a lot of information and um so this is a you know long-term thing but um when you were talking about that i was like oh my god here's a whole nother level of how i can show that this has existed in nature um and in this and in our species and other species for ever you know so um yeah just thought i'd throw it out there because i'm i'm taking notes and trying to figure out kind of where i'm going with it so uh -huh. it would be a big paper but kind of to me at least <laughs> i'd be my doctorate paper so <laughs> Yeah, important, there's, there's some really interesting stuff. Um, Dr. Apple at the uh, at Texas A&M, he is a plant pathologist, and he had some theories about certain fungi, like the what used to be called hypoxylon, now it's Biscognioxia, um, really complicated name. I can try my best to spell it, and it'll probably get you what you need. But um, uh he had this idea that it was probably a, a mutualistic relationship until the tree got um, the tree health declined, and then it becomes a, a parasite. So, in other words, it's it's potentially in the tree and having some kind of positive relationship until it's not. You know, it's like, oh, now the tree is weak. I'm going to just start taking kind of advantage of the tree being weak and start you know, helping to contribute to that uh, weakened tree and, and eating that wood and everything. And so, um, I mean, but, that, kind of, that kind of explains all disease, right? You know, it's like the, bo the body becomes imbalanced and then it goes too far in one direction and it yeah. can't right itself, which is how we use integrative medicine with modern medicine to hopefully get the body back. But yeah, that, that'd be interesting. And I have to, I'd have to figure out how to I mean, I could definitely use that, but I'd have to figure out how to go back to the, because basically what I'm stating is it's all about collaboration. It's not mm -hmm. about competition at all. And in fact, mm -hmm. that part of Darwin was a very small part of Darwin, but it got run with with a lot of um, scientists and sociologists and people that kind of ran with that concept, Hobbes and other philosophers and scientists mm -hmm. and stuff. And this sort of um, collaborative got squashed down. So. But maybe as the tree decomposes and then feeds the soil, it becomes collaborative again. I don't know. I'd have to look at that. But yeah, that's that's great information. Yeah. I don't know. I just found it really interesting. Um, yeah, it might not be exactly what you're looking for. It just got me thinking about it. Um, let's see. Talk about slime molds. So, um, so slime molds aren't actually fungi. Um, so... Slime molds are amoeba or amoebazoa, or I don't know what to call them exactly, but they're they're not fungi. They're not in the same uh, kingdom at all. Um, so I can't tell you a ton about them, um, but they they basically, um, as far as I understand, are kind of these single cellular organisms that work together um, and kind of. Uh, I don't know, they, they can do things on a larger scale because they work together. Um, uh, I don't know, does anyone else, can anyone else speak much about um, slime molds? I don't know too much about it, uh, much more than what you were just kind of talking about, like how they're like single-celled amoebas that when the conditions are right, they kind of form together and they organized to to uh to reproduce i think um, yeah they'll do reproduction i guess and um yeah so they'll form like a, a fruiting body and i guess some of them will play different roles in that fruiting body you know some will form maybe like the stalk and some will form uh i don't know those spores i guess um but yeah sorry i, I can't speak too too well to slime molds Lots of pup balls at the Arboretum right now. That's great. Those are fun. Um, have, it, have you looked into lichens, Sammy? Um, yeah, lichens are basically a, 
uh, mutualistic relationship between fungi and uh, algae. Um, let's see. Yeah. And eukaryotes are endosymbiotes of archaea and bacteria. So talk about symbiosis upon symbiosis, like all higher organisms are, are kind of a reflection of what you're talking about, of like this deep, deep mutualism. Mm -hmm. Some recommendations there. What is this? Kropo Kropotkin, Kropotkin mutual, yeah. mutual Aid? Hell yeah. What is that? Yeah, everyone read Kropotkin. He's a, he's a philosopher. He's from uh, Russia, and uh -huh. he kind of, kind of offered a different uh, kind of alternative hypothesis for human evolution through mutual aid and kind of based off uh, that humans are a social species, that kind of stuff. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend people read some Kropotkin. Yeah. Consequence of Bread. Conquest of Bread is another one of his famous books. Nice. Um, let's see. Uh, do I know much about endophytes? Uh, are you talking about like endomycorrhizal fungi, Carter? Um, or Perry, whichever one is, is on Carter's uh, computer. Um, like fungi that live inside the plant. Um, so I can't speak too well to that either. I, that sounds right down my alley. I just haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet. Um, so no, I can't speak too too well to that. Um, Jeremy had a, a slime mold video recommendation. As I understand too, Houston has either scientists at Rice or, um, and potentially, I want to say like in Katy, there's like a huge slime mold, uh, like one giant massive slime mold. Um, E.O. Wilson, he's great. I read a lot of his books in grad school. Um, you know, he studied ants. Uh, that's kind of how he got his start anyway, but like broadened his ideas from studying ants to other things. Um, and yeah, he's got some really great stuff. Let's see. Do you have a microscope or anything at home that you take these, the fungi back to your house and study them a little bit more? Or is it mainly like when you're in the field? I do have, I do have a microscope and I hardly use it. Um, yeah, I think I used it last for, uh, are y'all familiar with iNaturalist? Um, there's the City Nature Challenge. And uh, <laughs> I busted out my microscope for that because I was like, I think the way we're going to win is to get micro and like find, like I was trying to get like plankton and stuff like that uh, just to bump up our numbers of diversity. Um, so that was the last time I really uh, used it a lot. Um, I don't know. I just, um, no, I haven't really gotten into using it for fungi, but it seems like a really fun thing to start doing. So I should start doing that. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Carter. Yeah. I think I already talked about not knowing much about that. Um, have I seen ghost pipes in Houston? They're my fave back from Illinois. I've never seen them in Texas. They're in, uh, I know the Sam Houston National Forest. They're probably in the big thicket. Um, yeah, I looked on iNaturalist and I found, I found evidence of them in East Texas, but I've never actually seen them. And actually I have a friend, um, she works for the Bioland Conservancy and she shared a picture from the Sam Houston National Forest of some that she found. So um, yeah, they're around. Um, beautiful plants. They're actually relatives of, of uh, they're in the blueberry family, which you can kind of tell by the flowers too. If you kind of bell shaped blueberries, unusually, they're kind of facing down. But, um, okay, anything else? Yeah, I have another question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You talked briefly about the a project that you did with the city to get people out and like identify species. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I think oh, we're yeah. 
interested in hosting one or participating in one? Yeah, yeah. In general, they're called bio blitzes. And iNaturalist has been an amazing tool for uh, making bio blitzes readily available and doable for the, the general public because it just requires downloading a free app. You can um, use your phone to take pictures and immediately submit them into iNaturalist. And you can create a project. Um, so say you want to just look at them within uh, a nature center or maybe a broader area like the city of Austin or something like that. You can start incorporating any any observations from the city of Austin during that weekend or whatever can be added to your project. And you can also make your project kind of specific. It can be like, oh, we're only interested in flies for this weekend. So everybody go out and try to find as many flies as you want, or you can, you know, uh, make it a, a fungal, you know, weekend and just like, let's add every, you know, fungus we can find or whatever. Um, and so, uh, I think they're really fun and you can get really competitive with it. Um, and, um, yeah, I got super competitive in the Houston ones and we won several years in a row, uh, as far as diversity. And that's of course what I cared about. You know, there were multiple ways of, of competing in that. And, and it doesn't have to be a competition either. Uh, you can just, it can be a collaborative, uh, a thing where it's just, you know, everybody's meeting and working together and trying to find the most diversity of whatever, you know, they want to find. Um, but yeah, the City Nature Challenge, keep your eyes peeled for, for that next spring. That's, uh, that one's fun because there's so many observations that get added like in one weekend. Um, and if you aren't the type that likes to hike around, but you like to ID stuff, you can help out basically by sitting at your computer and just as the observations are coming in, people just take pictures and add it without knowing what it is. You can just sit at your computer and just be like, oh yeah, that's this, that's that, you know, and um, it can be really fun that way too. So, yeah. Anything awesome. else? Someone from Facebook was asking, uh, or they're saying they would love to, they're from Lone Star Mushrooms out of Tomball and would love to join your team for the mycology adventure at the Houston Arboretum. And they want to know how to get involved with that. Yeah. Annika shared her email earlier and she's the volunteer coordinator. So I'll drop uh, that in the chat then for them. Yeah. Here it is here. Do I need to resend that? No, I, I, I found you got it, it and okay, I great. noticed it, but yeah. So check out the Houston Arboretum. I need to check out the Houston Arboretum. Never been. Yeah. It's 155 acres. Uh, and there's been a lot of changes there, but I think it's all for the better. I mean, especially from my perspective, it's all increasing diversity of plant life for the most part. That's like their big push, you know? and native diversity. Um, so there's a lot of invasives that they've been, you know, tackling and trying to get a, a handle on. Um, so yeah, it's a great place. Cool. Will you lead a, a, a foray when it, when it's that time again? I certainly will. Yeah. I'd be happy to. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. We got it recorded. <laughs> you're sunk. You're 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 in. Hell, yeah, you're hell. I love to nerd out. I love to nerd out about this stuff. So, um, and you know, I'm not an expert by any means, but we'll try to figure it out together. You know, if we don't know what something is, we'll get out the book, and get out iNaturalist, and try to find out what it is. Um, so, I think it's yeah. I think it's better when people do it for the love and they just remain amateurs. I mean, obviously, we got to make money and pay the bills, but. Doing yeah. it for the love is just studying fungi for the love of it is just so much more pure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Remain an amateur for life. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't be knowledgeable, you know? You can still right. be uh, like that. And I get that from Gary Lenkoff. So shout out to him. Rest in peace. Uh, yeah, that was kind of his philosophy. He always called himself an amateur mycologist, even though he worked for the, I think it was the New York City Arboretum and studying fungi for them mm -hmm. 
And so he was technically doing it professionally, but he never called himself a professional mycologist. He just did it for the love. Yeah. Uh, Ted, I'm in Houston. Um, yeah. That's that's why I have that connection to the Arboretum. And, um, yeah, okay. I still join the society just because I, I love fungi and we don't really have a big uh, active society here in the Houston area. So, um, but I'm happy to, to be part of this and, and to meet y'all. It was, it was really nice to hang out that weekend too. The, and the big thicket, it was, it's always great to hang out with some mycophiles. So. Yeah. So yeah, a little quick thoughts, um, on the society, like as we grow, uh, we, I, I mean, it's always been my kind of goal and plan to uh, as we change and grow that we change to more of like a state-based society, but we have like regional chapters that people participate in because Texas is such a large state that it doesn't make sense to just have one in the bio. The, there's so much uh, eco ecological range across the state that it, it you know, for people are going to have different interests and different focuses based on that state or where they are in the state. And it's also like part of the fun of doing this is meeting other mycologists that you get to like, hang out with and know and become friends with and you know build relationships through fungi um and so the huge portion part of why we started this group and just called it central texas is because like we were doing it where we were locally but you know we'd fully you know in my mind in particular uh wanted to make this available to everyone and help people start chapters whenever they felt like they had enough interest in their immediate area so mm -hmm definitely want to grow this into yeah micro dating <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i need that like uh farmers only but like <laughs> uh, i don't know well, we'll become a member y'all and we can we can uh work on developing this for the central for the texas mycological society <laughs> uh, dating dating website and it's because that's like the beauty of this group is you become a member and you can you you really get what you put into it like you get out of it what you put into it so if you want to see something happen that's like fungal based like we can help make that happen that's that's kind of the goal so <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll find different stuff there at different times. I want to say probably, this is, sorry, this is referring to Ted asking about the big ticket uh, season for fungi. Um, I want to say you'll probably find highest diversity in like the spring and the fall, especially after, you know, some good rain. But, you know, we went uh, a little bit ago uh, for kind of a small socially distance, you know, foray and um, we didn't really have rain for a while and we saw pretty good diversity. Um, we saw some really cool stuff actually. Um, so, um, yeah, but I don't know, I guess probably in the spring, assuming things are all right, we could probably do another small thing. And people who are in the discord, feel free to like organize little you know, small get togethers, like we want to encourage people to be safe, but if you're a member, like you can talk to other members and probably find out uh, uh, if someone lives close to you that you could meet up with and kind of get that, get those little types of things rolling. But obviously we want to make sure everyone stays COVID safe because don't, we gotta, gotta still flatten the curve y'all still flatten the curve. We're not done yet. Yeah, for sure. Well, are we any more questions? I mean, we can still hang out in the the Zoom room, but I can in uh, in the broadcast here. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's do that.